a story for you this morning, uh, liberally adapted from the Greek myth of Cassandra. Cassandra was a princess of Troy, the daughter of Priam and Hecuba. The story goes that she was beautiful, though it does bear mentioning that all the stories we hear about women from long ago mention how beautiful they all were as a sort of reason why we should pay attention. So why don't we leave that alone for today? And we'll say instead that she was smart and she was kind and she was a good friend. Cassandra always told the truth. She tried to tell it in a way that didn't hurt people's feelings, but she did not lie. The god Apollo, god of the sun, saw her one day and became infatuated with her. He didn't even know her, but he decided that he had to have her. So he came to talk to her and he offered her all sorts of gifts, gold and linens, beautiful clothes. She wasn't really interested in those things. Frustrated, he asked her what she wanted and she said, well, I tell the truth. It's important to me to tell the truth. Um, this is a gift I already have. What is it you can give me that will support my gift? He thought, and he placed his hands over her eyes and said, Cassandra, you have the gift of sight now. You can tell the future. You already tell the truth about what you know. This is a gift that will expand what you know beyond what mere humans can know. You have the gift of prophecy. She thanked him and she turned to go. But he became angry saying, aren't you gonna give me something in return? You have to love me now. I gave you a gift, I'm a God, you have to love me now, that's how it works. Well, she was pretty surprised to hear that part, but he was a God and he was very powerful and she was afraid. But remember, she did not lie. So she said, thank you for this gift, but I do not love you. Well, Apollo was the kind of God not used to getting told no. He did not handle rejection very well. He became angry and he told her, fine, you are ungrateful. And so for that, you can keep your gift of prophecy. But I add this curse. You will tell the truth. You will know the truth, but no one will believe you. And he left. And it came to pass. She did. She did speak prophecies. She did tell the truth. She did divine the future and nobody listened to her until it was too late. She told her parents, the rulers of the city of Troy, not to accept a certain gift from the Greeks, for example. But they let in the giant wooden horse that the invading army had left at their door. And in the night, the soldiers burst out of the belly of the horse, burned the city, opened the gates and conquered Troy. If only they had listened to Cassandra. If you have a hymnal, please turn to hymn number 115, God of Grace and God of Glory. And two Putneys and a minister will be leading it. <clears throat> so my husband Wendell is about to join us. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power. Crown thy ancient church's story, bring its foot to glorious flower. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, Oh, of Oh, the clouds of evil round us hide thy brightness from our gaze. From the fears that long have bound us, free our hearts to faith and praise. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of these days, for the living of these days. 
You're thy children's warring madness and our pride to thy control. Shame our wanton selfish gladness, rich in things and poor in soul. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, make thy peace our daily goal. Make thy peace our daily goal. Fill us with a living vision, heal our wounds that we may be bound as one beyond division in the struggle to be free. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, ears to hear and eyes to see. Ears to hear and eyes to see. Ears to hear and eyes to see. Let those who are able observe and perceive. As we have heard in the story of Cassandra, there is a cost to prophecy. The prophets in the Old Testament were driven out of the city, driven mad, rebuked, censored, cursed, and unheard. Those who cried woe were often dismissed and ignored. It is so easy to shoot the messenger. The prophet Amos, prophesying in Israel during the reign of King Jeroboam II, speaks as the mouthpiece of God to the people. His criticism is that Israel has forsaken the poor and will be judged for their abandonment of justice. Amos says, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. Those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth. You turn justice into wormwood and bring down social solidarity. You can see maybe by why Amos was not very well liked or very well received in his time. The writings of the prophets were included in the Torah well after they were actually written or spoken. Amos prophesied destruction to the people of Israel, including an earthquake. And then there was an earthquake. So it's possible that the correctness of that prediction got him included in the canon after the fact. It's also possible that the people of later generations trying to make sense of their suffering under invasion and occupation from a sequence of empires and their occupying armies included the words of Amos in the Torah because of his strong moral guidance. Now you may in your life have heard such phrases as the God of the Old Testament is a God of judgment, but the God of the New Testament is a God of love. I invite you to let go of that way of understanding the God of the Bible. There's baked in anti-Semitism in this idea of an angry, vengeful God of the Jews and a loving God of Christians, for one. But also, remember that people wrote the Bible. And people wrote what we call the Bible over hundreds and hundreds of years. And they read the things that previous people had written or stories they had told in many cases. Now, this is the story, and in fact, many, many stories of people who are trying to make sense of centuries of war, violence, invasion, and occupation, trying to understand what they had done, if anything, to cause their own suffering. Now, you may agree or not agree about the ways that we cause our own suffering, but you can understand how a perfectly natural impulse, a perfectly natural human response to catastrophe is to cry out, what have I done? that I have brought this on myself? Why have I 
what do I, what did I do to deserve this, right? Perhaps you find yourself crying out those things, even if you know that's not how it works sometimes. This is a normal human response to incredibly traumatic events. And it is from that place that Amos prophesied and from that place that later generations heard the echo of his words and knew them to belong in the Torah. Amos prophesied in Bethel where the king resided and the high priest Amaziah said, go away seer, flee to Judah, eat bread there and prophesy. But don't ever again prophesy at Bethel because it is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. You can hear Amaziah saying, do not tell us the truth here at the seat of power. Do that later. Do that somewhere else. Do that after the midterms. Don't do that in an election year. I hear these verses and I cannot help but think of a certain political posture, the way we stop each other from criticizing politicians or certain presidents of a certain party. I speak specifically in the way that many people I care for and whom I respect defend the actions of and refuse to criticize presidents who are Democrats. Go away, see or flee to Judah. This is the sanctuary of President Biden who is not President Trump. This is the kingdom. Do not prophesy here. I think of Genesis Gutierrez, an undocumented trans woman immigration activist who dared to criticize President Obama, whom activists called the deporter in chief for the number of deportations that occurred during his tenure. And she was pilloried by liberals for prophesying in Bethel. Let us not appoint ourselves Amaziah, high priests of the temple of the nation, defender of the reputation of those that rule, all those who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth, all those who turn justice into wormwood and bring down social solidarity, whoever they are, of whatever party. You can hear Amos speaking through the ages to our reality today. And you can hear the Amaziahs of our age telling him to go to Judah, to eat bread and to prophesy there, to go back where he came from. The power of prophets comes not only from their predictive abilities, but what Unitarian theologian James Luther Adams calls ethical thinking, as in thinking about the particular problems of our age and the age to come. So this is our third in a series of this five smooth stones of religious liberalism, and this is the one about the prophets. Religious liberalism affirms the moral obligation to direct one's effort toward the establishment of a just and loving community. It is this which makes the role of the prophet central and indispensable in liberalism. I remind us all once again that religious liberalism is related to though different from liberal political views. Adam says, the role of the prophet is central. It is indispensable to religious liberalism. And yet we know that the prophets are disregarded, cast out, unheeded, marginalized, and shot. We need only to think of civil rights leaders, black freedom fighters who were maligned and assassinated, and then whose legacies were either tarnished or whitewashed and sanitized and domesticated. You may have heard that Martin Luther King Jr. said, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. He read his Bible, that's from the prophet Amos, whom King knew well. King knew that Amos also said, oh, you who turn justice to wood, wormwood and cast down righteousness to the earth. 
God who made the Pleiades and Orion and turns deep darkness into the morning and darkens the day into night, who makes destruction flash forth against the strong so that destruction comes upon the fortress. They hate him who reproves in the gate. They abhor him who speaks the truth. I know how many are your transgressions and how great are your sins, you who afflict the righteous, who take a bribe and turn aside the needy in the gate. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts will be with you. As you have said, hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord, the God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. So the judgment from the prophets of the Old Testament, many of whom speak like Amos, is a judgment against people who abandon their vulnerable and who disregard the truth tellers among them. An important question for us in our age is why, why do we disregard the truth tellers among us? Why do we abandon our vulnerable? Is it because we are by nature selfish and terrible and doomed? Is it a mistake or an accident? I don't think so. Most Unitarian Universalist theologians and um, thinkers, philosophers of human nature don't think so. Uh, there is, there's room for a wide range of theological anthropology, meaning um, what does our religion teach us is the nature of human beings. But how I think of it is um, we are creatures. We are neither good nor evil. We are fearful and powerful creatures filled with possibility. We are dreamers and yet we are sometimes limited in our ability to dream. So why is it that we abandon our vulnerable? Why is it that we disregard the truth tellers among us? Perhaps it is our fear and our faithlessness that it could be otherwise. It's always been this way. This is just the way of the world. There's not enough to go around. It can't be otherwise. Our faithlessness and our fear. So we sing that great hymn, that 20th century social gospel hymn, grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour, for the living of these days, because we do need courage to hear the prophets, to heed the wisdom of the prophets. And the prophets themselves need courage. Those who tell the truth and are disbelieved, not because of the caprices of Apollo, but because of the desperate clinging of human beings to power and to myths of national innocence. We do not believe it is the curse of a jealous God, like Apollo, that causes us to ignore and push out the prophets. It is fear. Fear that there isn't enough, not enough land, not enough resources, not enough love, not enough space, not enough possibility, not enough political will. On a political level, the prophets call us back to abundance. According to Amos, if the tight fists of power are loosened, God will restore the city. For us in these days, if the tight fists of power are loosened, who knows what beauty, what ease, what creativity, what joy we will see in our time. Prophecy functions on a political level. I don't mean partisan. I don't mean electoral necessarily. I mean, prophecy functions on a level that describes how human beings cooperate, act, and share power. But also, there is a prophetic part inside of each of us. There's a part inside of each of us to whom the spirit speaks clearly. 
This is the part of you that wants to scream and tear your hair out in the center of the city until they run you out of town. This is the part of you that doesn't care to be diplomatic. This is the part of you that dreams. This is the part of you that refuses to accommodate your desires to what you think you are going to get. I'm gonna say that again. This is the part of you that refuses to accommodate your desires to what you think you are going to get. This is the part of you that wants more love, more tenderness, more respect, more access. This is the part of you that knows what you deserve and speaks woe on all the places where you are treated as less than human, less than worthy of love. On all the other parts of you that oppress or squash dreams or divide or tell you to be quiet, are you accommodating your dreams and your desires to what you think you're going to get? Are you doing that in your relationships, in your family, in your friendships, in your job, in your church, in your political convictions? Is there a part of you that is Amaziah saying, go to Judah, get out of here. We don't want to hear that here. You deserve the, you disturb the peace here. Is there a part of you that is Amaziah and another part that is Amos? Is there a part of you speaking freedom for yourself and for everyone? Is there another part of you telling that part to pipe down? This is relevant, I think, to all of us, but especially, especially if you work in the helping professions, if you have been socialized to put other people's needs before your own. If you have been taught that your comfort is an inconvenience, that your pronouns are difficult, that your body is wrong, that your sexuality is deviant, that your purpose is to serve, that your anger is unpalatable. that your children mess things up? Is there a part of you that prophesies, saying you can be restored, you can dream, you can speak on the things you long for, you can shout at the gates of the city and maybe, maybe you will be heard. Can you disregard the Amaziah within? There is a cost. It is possible already that you have prophesied and been cast out for it. It is possible that you have spoken truth to power and been fired. It is possible that you have demanded to be treated better in a relationship and the relationship has ended. It is possible that you have told the truth about who you are and who you want to be and your family has abandoned you. It is possible that you have prophesied and paid the cost. Be strengthened. I will tell you this morning that I do not strive to be a prophet if I can help it. For one thing, they get fired or worse. But I do strive to listen for the prophets of our age, to be one with ears to hear and eyes to see, to cultivate my ability to perceive and to react, to receive a message and to respond accordingly. Even if the consequences are high on a personal spiritual level, and in my politics, meaning my relationship to other people and to power. It is not the curse of an angry, jealous Apollo that prevents us from hearing the prophets, from heeding the message of the prophets among us and inside us. It is fear.
you have heard me say on a number of occasions, the one of the most often repeated phrases in scripture is this, do not be afraid. And usually it happens when something really scary is going on. The counter to fear is not reason. Actually, the counter to fear is faith. Faith in possibility. And so with trembling and tenderness, may our hearts be opened to the prophetic voices within and around us. Those voices crying out judgment on the devastating consequences of our fear and crying out hope even louder, that yet and still, it could be otherwise. They point the way to possibility. Let us heed their message. May it be so for you and so for us all. Amen. When we sing our meditation hymn, we allow the spirit to move through us with our breath. We sing the things we cannot say. We sing our prayers and our heartbreak, our hopes and our yearnings. We come together in song this morning in this sacred space. Will you stay seated and open your hearts for our meditation hymn number 123, Spirit of Life. Spirit of life, come unto me, sing in my heart all the stirrings of compassion, blow in the wind, rise in the sea, move in the hand giving life the shape of justice. Roots hold me close, wings